Hi students, welcome to the notes on the periodic table. Please get out your notebook and turn to the appropriate page so you're able to take notes. Now because this is a video, I want to remind you that you have control. You are able to pause, you are able to rewind, you're even able to fast forward or move along quickly if you really needed to. So be sure to take control when you need to, to go at your own pace. Let's get started. The first thing I want you to do is to set up your notebook. Now here we'll start with the essential question at the top. I'll give you that essential question on the next screen. But at the bottom, I just want you to lay out some space for the key terms, connections, and questions. This is just a modified Cornell style of notes to get you to interact more with your notes to make sure you're understanding what's going on and extracting the most information. Don't just write notes down, interact with them. If you need to pause this video now to write these things down, please do so. Are you ready? Let's go. Let's start with the essential question at the very top. Please write this in your header in a colored ink because this is something that I want you to focus on to realize that the notes are there to, to be able to answer this question and you should be able to answer this question by the end of this page. How is the periodic table organized? It's kind of a deep question. This isn't something you can answer with one word, maybe a few sentences, maybe a paragraph, but remember that. So first, what is the periodic table? You may have seen it all over the place. You may or may not know what it is, but you know, quite simply here, the periodic table is an organized table of elements. They're laid out in groups, or we'll call them columns for now, and periods, which are rows, based on similar chemical and physical properties. So this is the periodic table in all of its glory. We've seen this. You've probably seen it on science-y stuff or in science classrooms, and it's an extremely important table. Now, who made it? Well, Dmitry Mendeleev was the man, the scientist involved in the creation of the periodic table. He was one of many to come up with an idea, but his idea really stuck out. What he did was he took elements known to his time, and as you read before, put them in groups and periods, or rows and columns, um, based on similar chemical and physical properties. Here you can see kind of an example uh, from what he wrote in his notebook. This is an excerpt from one of his notebooks, and it's truly amazing. You can see how he kind of clumped things in certain spots. You can see that there are certain elements next to other elements with similar chemical and physical properties according to his day. Now, like I said, there was a lot of people who thought of periodic tables, but what men made Mendeleev's table stand out was, was this. Mendeleev was pretty bold in his understanding of the periodic table, of, of his organization. And what was really cool is that he made predictions based on the properties and the organization that he had. This is why his table was so unique and awesome. You can see here that here we have two elements, element 68 and 70, that didn't exist during Mendeleev's time. He put question marks there and he said, hey, I don't know these elements exist, but I'm making a prediction saying that they do. And in fact, they belong here in this group on the periodic table, which is really cool. So I keep on using terms, group, period. Um, let's make sure we really understand what these are all about. These are definitions that you need to know when we talk about the periodic table. It's kind of periodic table and science lingo. I always say pictures say a thousand words. You know, you might want to consider drawing a picture, but here, here's what groups are. Groups are just vertical columns on the periodic table. So you can see here there's the red group, the orange group, the yellow group, the green group. Now watch out for color. Color doesn't necessarily mean anything on the period on, on all periodic tables. It's not standard. You'll see a lot of periodic table with colors, but they're not all standard. So um, don't go based on color, go based on that groups are vertical columns. Periods, on the other hand, are horizontal rows. So again, we have the, the top period, the red row, and notice that it jumps a big gap. There's the first one on the very top left, and then there's the second one. So here's the first one, and then there's the second one. It jumps all the way over to the right, but this is one row, and then there's the orange row, and then there's the yellow row. We call those periods. So this is lingo you're going to need to know, and be beware of it because I'm no longer going to use, or and we should no longer use columns and rows, we need to call them groups and periods when we talk about the periodic table. Another definition you might want to be aware of is main group elements versus transition elements. Now take a look at this key, this, this periodic table here. Again, colors are a little bit different, but this is pointing out that the main group elements are these red ones and the transition elements are the orange ones. The periodic table is really unique in its shape. If you kind of look, there's kind of these turrets, or uh, I've, I've heard it kind of 
mentioned that this looks kind of like a castle and there's these castle turrets that stand up a little bit higher than the others. Those are the main group elements. So these red ones that stand up tall. Now there's a big gap here and the ones that sit lower down here are called the transition elements. Now in our class, we will talk about the transition elements a little bit, but for the most part, a lot of physical science one is all about main group elements. Another definition I need you to know is element families. And if you look here on the periodic table, these colors represent the different families of the periodic table. There seems to be kind of unique and scattered, but if you look at it, they're very similar to groups. Like you can see here, this family, this pink family right here is, is just a column or a group on the periodic table, maybe minus hydrogen. But here, these are called families because they're groups that have similar chemical and uh, chemical properties to one another. And they're kind of clumped together on the periodic table. So if we were to extract one of the elements in the periodic table and just look at the information attained there, uh, this is what one might look like. This is carbon. And I want to talk about the different pieces. Now just be aware that each of these pieces might be found on different parts of, of the element um, sheet, but you'll kind of see the same four things in most tables. So let's start about talking about each piece. Uh, the first one here is element name. It's pretty self-explanatory. It just tells you what the name of the element is. This next number here, usually a whole digit number, and it's found in order on the periodic table, is the atomic number. Now, the atomic number is an extremely important number because it, it represents the identity of that atom. And if you recall from last unit, the identity of the atom is really just the number of protons. And so the atomic number is the number of protons that that element contains. So carbon here has six protons. You'll also see element symbols. And element symbols, if you look, all have the pattern themselves. Um, a couple of things you should be aware of with element symbols is um, you can only have up to two letters only. And so here carbon only has one, but all the other elements only go up to two letters. Now, one of the rules is if there are two letters, the first letter is always capitalized. So if it's the only letter like here, carbon, it's capitalized. Um, the second letter will have to be lowercase. And this is so when we write elements together, we can tell them apart from one another. Finally, the last thing to be aware of is that the element symbol does not always match the element name. Uh, we get this a lot from students who, like for example, here's potassium. Potassium is not a P, it's a K. And so the, each of these names just represent the different elements and it could be based on a Latin name, it could be based on a scientist's name, uh, it could be based on a lot of things, but the symbol doesn't always match the name. So potassium is K. A lot of students are like, well, why didn't they just make potassium P? Well. There's phosphorus. Phosphorus is already reserved the P, so they needed to think of something else. The last number you see here is called the average atomic mass. Now this number down here is, a, is an, another important number and we can extract information from this. The average atomic mass, if you think about where all the mass of an atom is located, this was discovered by uh, Ernst Rutherford, who discovered that most of the mass, most of the density of the atom is found in the center part called the nucleus. So this average atomic mass just represents the total number of subatomic particles in the nucleus or the average mass of the weight of the nucleus. Now, if you remember the nucleus is just the number of protons, and the number of neutrons together, then that's really kind of cool. We, we know how many particles are in there. All right, so that's all I have for notes. Um, you might want to take some time right now and fill in the bottom part of your notebook. Now that you've gone through the notes, make sure you use um, and list the key terms. You don't need to write the definitions, just write the key terms. Take some time to make some connections to prior content experience. What have we talked about before in this class that can connect to stuff we've talked about in this page right here? Or maybe what are some things in life that you're familiar with that might also apply or have been applied in this that you can make those relationships? Finally, questions. Um, this is a little bit harder for students to do, but you can write questions that you may have. Do you have a question about the notes that you need to work on? Um, or better yet, think of a test question that, or two or three that you can write based on what you see in the notes. Now, again, I recommend doing multiple choice and something that's a little bit higher level than just define this or what is that. Try to think of some questions that have multiple, maybe multiple perspectives. All right, that's all I have for you guys. Good luck.